Well, the most up-to-date research on cell phone radiation involves thousands of studies that have been done in animals and a number of studies in humans, and they are finding pretty consistently now that when you expose animal cells and human beings to cell phone radiation, you can damage their sperm, damage the quality of the babies they produce, and increase cancer. And the cancer risk, which is the most frightening to most people, is the one that may not be the most important. The most important may be the effects on the brain, on memory, on sleep, on recall, on behavior, on attention deficit disorder, and other things that we're starting to understand better. But I would say that at this point, there's a fairly compelling body of research that shows harm from cell phone radiation. And more importantly, even if we aren't definitive about the nature of the harm, what are we doing by experimenting with our children? If you use an earpiece um, as long as it's wired and as long as it is not running down into your body, then you are better off than not. And the best, of course, is a speakerphone or running the speaker through your car radio. Uh, then you are not getting the radiation going into your body. Well, as long as the phone is on speaker and the signal is not weak and it's kept some distance from you, that's fine. It's preferable really not to have a phone in your hand for long periods of time. So what I tell people is take it out, put it in, on a table. When you have to transport it, put it on airplane mode because it's not sending or receiving microwave radiation. Otherwise, it's programmed to send and receive microwave radiation 900 times a minute. I don't think we know that there's any risk associated with that, but in the home what we have to worry about is where is the Wi-Fi router located, how many devices are you using, and is anybody unaware that you should never have a tablet on your body? They're called tablets because they belong on tables, they do not belong on the body. So it's the multiple exposures that you get in the household, and particularly where the router is located, and we encourage people to uh, use wired rather than wireless whenever they can. Well, we encourage people to go wired rather than wireless when possible, and it actually is easier to do that. What most people don't realize, companies are setting routers so that they have two different frequencies operating, and one of them allows anybody to poach on your router without your knowing it. And so we really encourage people to call and get that one deactivated. Get the one that you need, which is usually 2.4 gig, to work in your home, but not have your house router work as a hotspot for anybody that's passing by. Of course, whenever you're in a moving vehicle that has metal around it, it's like being in a microwave oven, except that there are windows. And the oven has a window with a mesh screen so that, in fact, the radiation is not supposed to come out of the microwave oven. But again, a cell phone is a two-way microwave radio. If the person using the phone has their phone going through the car radio, so it's on the car Bluetooth speaker, that is the only way that you can use that phone safely. Phones are smart. 900 times a minute, they do a handshake with the tower. Where are you? Here I am. Where are you? Here I am. And so long as that is happening and you're in a moving vehicle, the signals are pinging all over the place. That is not a good time to be using a phone unless it's an emergency. You don't want anyone to be sitting too close to a television for lots of reasons, especially little kids in terms of vision problems that we're seeing increasingly. But a lot of these newer uh, TVs are streaming and Wi-Fi, and we really don't have good information about the levels of radiation. In all circumstances, distance is your friend. Well, in all circumstances, use wired instead of wireless. In this, it's a trivial, trivial exposure, but we are now raising our children in an environment 
that has never existed even five years ago. They are growing up in a sea of microwave radiation that has not been tested for its impact on the developing body and brain. We are doing one huge human research project without any controls. I'm not worried about infrared. Bluetooth is about 10,000 times weaker, 1,000 times weaker than wireless. But what I do not think is a good idea is to go around all day long with these expensive things in your brain, which are Bluetooth, because if they're on 24 hours a day, and there are people who are apparently sleeping with these things, playing music to go to sleep, etc., then you're getting exposed. And over your lifetime, your total exposure could be substantial. Besides, why would you put something deep into your brain with any exposure that normally wouldn't be there? There are some studies that indicate that having a phone right next to the head for 50 minutes changes the nature of brain chemistry and increases the amount of glucose in the brain. And by the way, an increase in glucose in the brain has been associated with Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's has been called diabetes of the brain. Depends again. Distance makes all the difference. How close you are to the source is what determines your response. They're all forms of microwave radiation. There's been a very interesting study recently published from India. As you know, uh, there's a lot of emotion associated with living next to a tower. In fact, it's not the tower that you have to be concerned about. It's the antennas on the tower. Those are the radiating devices. This brilliant study from India it took blood from people who lived right next to towers and further away from them and further away still. And what they found is that there are biological markers in the blood of the people who live closest to the towers that are consistent with increasing the risk of cancer, arthritis, and heart disease. Damage in their blood from living close to a cell phone tower. And they took into account how many other wireless devices they were using in their home and workplace. This is a very important study because it shows that proximity to a tower can be damaging to people if they're in the plume of the antenna. And it's the antenna, not the tower, you have to worry about. A tall, tall tower with antennas 500 feet at the top is not going to have an immediate effect on you if you're living close to it. But there is a plume, and if you had a house on a mountain within 100 meters, you might be getting a very high exposure. The Cleveland Clinic on its website says that men should not keep phones in their pocket if they want to have healthy children. The state of California has recently issued guidance saying the same thing. And many authorities in other countries agree. Men and women should not carry phones close to their body. So you look at your iPhone, you go to settings, you go to general, then you go to about, then you scroll all the way down to something called legal, and then you click on that and you get to RF exposure. And there inside your phone, it tells you, phones are tested at a certain distance off the body. And I'm going to talk today about how the distance the phone is held off the body makes all the difference in your exposure. If a phone is on the body, it's exceeding current test guidelines. And the French have shown that it exceeds those test guidelines by two to tenfold. Well, of course it is. And the question is, if the signal is OK, um, that's fine. But again, we ha are in the middle of an experiment. Why do you want to have that capacity on all the time? Why do you want to be exposed unnecessarily to microwave radiation? Um, we, have, we ought to have the choice. When it comes to modern cars today, they're like a video game you walk into with a huge screen with all the bells and whistles and doodads. <clears throat> there is an increase in car death over the past three years. Nobody's been talking about it. There's no question in my mind and that of many others that these increased entertainment uh, centers inside vehicles are contributing to that. No. And a GPS uses a satellite. The concern for the GPS is distracted driving, not the ex phys physical exposure.
I don't know. It's a good question. There's so much work that needs to be done, and the thing that's kind of outrageous, as I'm going to show you uh, today, is that we in the United States always call for research in response to identifying this problem, but we never do it. So if you look at the great body of research that's been done, most of it's been done outside of the United States. And you look at the one large study I'm going to talk about with the National Toxicology Program, there's a huge disinformation campaign rolling out right now to try to discredit and dismiss the results of the largest study ever done in this topic in the United States. Scientists who work in this field in the United States often find themselves without a job and without funding if they get results that the companies don't like. And I've written about that in my book, Disconnect. It's a dangerous area to work in in the United States. Well, distance is your friend. Start to disconnect yourself and recognize you need to claim your life back. You've got uh, Roger McNamee, one of the f founders of uh, Facebook now, warning about the addictive properties of all of these things, admitting that he's addicted and that the pr software has been programmed to addict people and calling for these companies uh, to be more responsible. You've got Jaina Partners and the California Teachers Union writing to Apple asking them to have better policies on children because there's a recognition that these companies work with and depend on the fact that they can make you want to be liked. Well, how many likes you have really isn't a measure of what kind of person you are. Not that I know of, yes. Not so, a single one that I've ever seen that I've looked for independent data actually works. The people selling them are often well-meaning, they believe in it, and there is a placebo effect. I, I know that, but I have not seen any data showing that any of them work. And the thermography images they show with the heat, the heat is not what we're concerned about. We're concerned about the microwave radiation at levels that don't necessarily cause heat, but they can damage sperm. We know that from studies that have been done with healthy men. You take their sperm and you put it in two test tubes and one test tube is not exposed to cell phone radiation and the other is. And the test tube exposed to cell phone radiation, those sperm die three times faster with three times more damage to their DNA. Yes, because of course metal is an, an antenna and it, it attracts these things. So you want to try to avoid that, but more importantly, you want your bedroom to be an EMF free zone. You can put a kill switch on for all the electricity in the bedroom. You can have a power strip connect all your devices and turn them off. But you should keep your devices out of your bedroom. And you should not have your phone under your pillow or fall asleep listening to, uh, to it unless it's on airplane mode. And for goodness sakes, don't sleep with a Fitbit or um, these, these things because we have growing evidence that these devices may be causing cardiac problems. Yes, they can monitor your heart rate but they might also be altering it. EMFs, it's not just at this point a physiological issue. It's a psychological, spiritual, and moral issue. We've got to reclaim our rights and our privacy as individuals, and specifically in the family. Those families that are struggling with teenagers, you've got to take the devices away at dinner time. I w if I had teenagers now, I would absolutely take the devices away in the evening, and make sure that they can't sneak out with their girlfriend or boyfriend, which has been known to happen, and they make rendezvous and text all night long. You've got to, you have to stop that. They need, teenagers need 10 to 12 hours of sleep, and they're not getting it as, as it is. And many adults are sleep deprived as well, because if you look at your device for the hour before you go to bed, it's stimulating and interfering with the natural production of melatonin that starts with the natural rhythm. We need sunlight in the morning to wake ourselves up, and we need darkness so that we sleep and we produce melatonin that is a wonderful natural hormone that repairs damage in the nighttime. If you have a lot of blinking lights and blue lights in your bedroom, you're not going to get as restful as sleep. There's both animal literature and human literature, and there's an extensive literature. You can find more about this on our website at ehtrust.org. We have, uh, we have uh, science for skeptics, we have information, FAQs, frequently asked questions about the National Toxicology Program. There's an extensive body of research on this at this time. And the problem is that people are in denial. 
people don't understand, for example, something like psoriasis can be triggered by electromagnetic fields, can be made worse by it. And I have had people who had psoriasis and insomnia, and when they unplug uh, and for a week, things cleared up. It was amazing. No, they're not, and they're not because they're being run right now by the cell phone industry. That's been the case under the Obama administration, and it certainly is the case now under the Trump administration, where the head of the FCC and several appointed officials come directly from the telecom industry. So there's Fox is in charge of the chicken coop, and that's been going on for more than a decade. Well, I've written a book about this called Disconnect, the Truth About Cell Phone Radiation, and the answer is it's complicated, and the complexity of the issue makes it very easy for people to want to trust. Well, after all, it's a very convenient device we have here. It must be useful. We should keep using it. And if there really was a problem, we'd have people dropping in the street. Well, guess what? The kinds of problems you have from cell phones, things like insomnia, uh, memory loss, uh, distraction, depression, uh, attention deficit disorder, uh, and, and, and then in terms of cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, parotid gland malignancies, these have multiple causes, all of them. So being able to sort out the contribution of cell phones and other forms of wireless radiation is really problematic. Scientifically, it's a hard thing to do. And because it's complicated, we say, well, it's really, we can't do anything about it. We're all going to die anyhow, forget it. I'm telling you that the quality of our life and that of our children will be substantially improved if we limit these exposures now and understand how to change the hardware and the software. The technology has revolutionized our lives in many good ways. Response to emergency, improving business and trade, ability to communicate in quick time, real time, that's all great. But we're also paying a price because we're living as though we're constantly in a state of crisis and our bodies are constantly on high alert. And that's putting our adrenal glands at stress, that's stressing our bodies, and it's creating a stress-like culture where everything is going like this all the time, and we're not really getting the kind of rest that we need to restore ourselves and our souls. Well, we know that when people go to the Cleveland Clinic or go to infertility clinics all over the world, one of the first things doctors say to them is, where do you use your phone and get it out of your pocket? Because the data on that are rock solid. Cell phones can damage sperm quantity and quality. And that is why many experts around the world advise that men not carry phones on their body. And we tell nobody to carry a phone in their pocket. Because phones are tested off the body, as I'm going to show, and I have some original footage I can share with you from testing that's been done, independent laboratories will confirm. Cell phones kept in the pocket exceed the current test limits, which are 20 years old, relying on 30-year-old science. The Real Truth About Health Conference is an opportunity to reach an audience that's broader, because the only way we're going to address this problem is with an educated public that knows what they have the right to demand from companies and the government and the, for themselves. And the only way they're going to learn that is through the kinds of information that we can provide in a public forum such as this one.